What's this thing? Come back to that story in a sec. Zoom in on the cucumber, please. That is a cucumber in the family Senolactidae. Cool. Okay. That's a good color. Got some fresh poop on the left there, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the 74 hour dive, that was for Ocean Networks Canada. That was a uh, cabled underwater observatory work where we're deploying and recovering and maintaining subsea instrumentation that actually lives down there for years at a time. So we go down fully loaded with instruments and run around unplugging stuff, plugging stuff in, cleaning cameras, whatever, whatever. And uh, because we're not taking samples, we don't fill up our sample space. So it's a lot of doing work instead of uh, exploring. And that, yeah, that got us our probably our longest dive. What's the depth of that observatory? Uh, it goes all over the place, but that specific dive, I think that was at a 2200 meter site. I can't quite remember. But there's there's observatory platforms, whether it's Venus or Neptune or the two main uh, observatory networks. They go from anywhere from, I don't know, 30 meters deep to 2500. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, staying down there for 72 hours would definitely save on the uh, mid-water transit time up oh, and heck down. Yeah. Absolutely. Has some really extreme locations too. Sometimes there's, well, in one extreme, the uh, east coast of Vancouver Island, the Venus network has some of the worst visibility ever. It's all the sediment coming out from the Fraser River, and you can barely see the end of the manipulator. So you're trying to find a, some subsea instrumentation, you're flying by sonar only. If you look away from your sonar for just a second, you can just bonk right into it, which I've definitely seen and possibly done. <laughs> then the other extreme is the deep stuff, which is very clear, but it's in uh, erupting underwater volcanoes, which is incredible. Does Hercules have any um, sensors that can warn you about temperature changes, uh, like erupting volcanoes? Um, I don't think well, a temperature change would give you any information. If you wanted to know about a volcano erupting, you'd probably need some seismic data. Yeah, the, the temperature, I mean, the volcanoes are actively erupting and have been for years. Um, and we often stick a temperature probe in there. We have the temperature probe you're reading temperature from even at home. That thing right now is showing one and a half degrees Celsius, but coming out of the water coming out of those hot vents can be over 350 degrees Celsius. Um, so we put the temperature probe inside those actively venting sites. But if you move the temperature probe away, I don't know, a couple centimeters, then it's instantly down to like two or three degrees Celsius. So the very localized temperature, uh, very localized hot fluids. So that means it's relatively safe for you guys to be working at those depths as long as you know where the vents are. Yep, totally. That being said, I've definitely seen a some some pieces of Hercules get melted. That was my next question. Yeah, it's an active consideration when you're flying around those areas, specifically the tether. That's the most critical. Do not melt that. But uh, sometimes things just change color a little bit. We have a light on the front of Hercules. It's been there for years now and still works fine but it is a little more gray than the other ones because it got roasted like a marshmallow There's yeah, some more of those really large dead sponge skeletons. Pretty incredible, isn't it? 
Yeah, those are huge. Even painting the lasers on it, that's definitely almost a meter and a half, two meters. It's a long, long boy. Yeah, definitely. With all these skeletons around, like, are you, I'm so surprised they found that, what was it, a beaked whale skull on the last set cruise? Oh, yeah. Cause they all look it the looks same. exactly like that. Yeah, I would yeah, never yeah. even notice it. Wouldn't think twice. I forgot about that. That was really cool to see. Yeah, totally cool. But we we would have drove right by it. Yeah. <laughs> I keep thinking that like one of them is going to be something really awesome, and then you know I see like the the tendrils. Yeah. Like, oh no, that's just another. They're show. all really awesome. They are all really awesome. Yeah, you do do you do have to keep your eye out for some things like that. Not not make the assumption that everything is uh, something of interest. And, and those whale bones, I think they can uh, get that finger ferro manganese crust growing on them. Yeah, just the one like they the found was very black in color and just like those sponge skeletons. <laughs> yep. We've seen that ferromanganese crust on top of sponge bodies too. I think we saw some last cruise. And that's sort of an indicator of how old that old skeleton is. Mm -hmm. Are you okay for a move or do you want to wait till dinner relief comes up? Ah, uh, go ahead, yeah. Okay. It's fine. Here's a question back on the volcano front. Um, would an earthquake, you know, like, say, the ones off the Oregon coast, affect our dives at all? Sorry, what was the question? Would an earthquake affect our dives? You know, like the earthquakes that we've been having off the Oregon coast, would that have any effect on our dives? Where is the earthquake? Where are we diving, I think, is the right, question. Right, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, like any seismic activity, I don't think really disturbs if you're under the water. It doesn't really disturb, even if you're right by it. I don't think that does anything. Yeah, as long as yeah. you're far enough away, it doesn't really matter. Now, if that earthquake generated a tsunami, that could be a, a different matter. That would affect Probably us on the surface. Definitely. Yeah, affect us on the surface, yeah. and uh, you don't want to be really close to bottom just in case uh, we are moving up and then we move back down. Yep. Uh, that could be a challenge for our pilots. If you're right over the epicenter, though, you won't feel anything. Yeah. It's probably the safest place to be. The eye of the boat. storm? Over the epicenter? I'd don't think that's true. <laughs> that would be For a dangerous a tsunami? place. Because the tsunami wave, it gains force as it goes farther. So totally, like but right the, over. you can get the big, I don't know what the word is. I don't oh, know the if it's a gas bubble slides. or some other stuff where your ship just sinks. Yeah, what? let's not do that. Let's not do that. I don't know what the word is. I, I'm probably saying it wrong. If you have an earthquake right underneath the ship, you can have weird, like, something, something. Like or a the, cavitation bubble or something? Something like that, yeah. Or really it's just that to sink the ships of the world. Thank you. I like the red things. They're pretty. I have They're seen quite a few of those. Yeah, those are Brasingid sea stars. And they're actually filter feeders. So when you see them, they have their arms sort of up in the water column. Uh, they actually have like little, little sticky pads that stuff will stick to. And then they'll bring that food to their mouth, which is on their underside. Can you do a half zoom, please? That's good. I like how they pop in every now and again on this watch. It's like a little <laughs> burst of color. Oh, yeah. Um, you can actually see these in quite high densities on wrecks, oftentimes. So off the south shore of Oahu, uh, there are quite a few shipwrecks, and we've seen these prestigious sea stars uh, all over them. Why 13 legs? 
Why 13? Um, I guess it's a lucky number. Maybe. Is that just because it's lost some? Or is it a fixed number for a certain species? Um, that's a good question for uh, Chris Ma at the Smithsonian. I'm not exactly sure um, if that pertains to species identification for the Brasingids, um, but I'm sure certain species do have a certain number. Um, that is definitely true for some of the animals that I know, but I'm not sure if it's true for the Brasingids. They could have even more legs. Oh, there's another one. huge sponge. Oh my goodness. It's like a little graveyard. I'm going to go more this way. No, I'm, I'm going to go more that way. I'm just yonder that way. We're seeing a lot more sediment. Kind of looks like uh, we're getting close to the top of this feature. Little little local knoll. Mini mountain, almost the there. mini mountain. We. We have some USBL confetti. We're almost at the top of a mini mountain. Everything's good. A mini mountain? Mini mountain. For everyone watching, uh, we are swapping out the watch so they can go eat some dinner. So you'll get a dinner relief for 30 minutes or so until they come back on. Go for Zoom. So still here. Okay, go wide. So that was a uh, sea lily in the family Hyocrinidae, and it was actually missing two of its legs. So they usually have five. So we've been doing um, some 50 meter steps. Um, to the top of this little bump, 0 0.4 knot transfer speed, 164. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Another one of those then? Yeah, that sounds great. Great. Bridge nav, another 50 meters, 164, 0 0.4 knots. Correct. Thank you. Do you have Pavel on the bridge? Just now. I think he must have stepped up for reading. Okay. Go for Zoom. This is another one of those uh, uh, um, Rumilogorgia militaris a type of chrysogorgia coral or golden coral. You can identify this animal because all of the polyps 
are sort of lining up military style along each one of these um, branches. Okay, go wide. Megan, a question came in about corals. Um, do corals that exist in deep water differ somehow from those which are closer to the surface in order to withstand higher pressure? Um, well, for our deep water corals, it's more about temperature than it is about pressure. So you might see a similar community of animals uh, just in cold waters further north or south, uh, as we're seeing here in the depths near Hawaii. So these animals are adapted to life in, in the deep sea um, to live at these cold temperatures. And, uh, you know, animals that might be living further north but in uh, higher current areas might have a little bit more robust body types or body forms in order to be able to withstand more current that you might not see down in the deep sea. So that might be something they might adapt for. But it's not as much about pressure. Science, do we have a sample coming up soon or anything like that? Um, no, our okay. next rock sample won't be for uh, until we get to 2,500 meters, okay, great. give or take. Or if we're following uh, this to the T, 2,570 meters, exactly, on the dot. <laughs> Where did that number come from? I'm not sure. It's what's on my paper. <laughs> <laughs> we were 11 meters off from our target depth on the last one. Not good enough. Oh, no. Yeah. We, we got to do better. Yeah, that last one was supposed to be uh, 2932. <laughs> That's pretty random. Makes for a fun game, though. Try to get it right there. Sometimes you just can't find a rock. Exactly. Yeah, I can already picture the nodule field that we will encounter. <laughs> <laughs> it's as big as the Sahara. <laughs> teeny tiny rocks. Well, yeah. I saw that giant one you guys were trying to pick yeah. up. Did pick it up, didn't fit it into the box. Yeah, I didn't think it was going to fit. And then... Uh, it didn't fit. <laughs> no portrait? <laughs> okay, so it turns out it probably would have fit if I had tried hard enough. Um, but yeah. here we are, <laughs> surrounded by rocks. <laughs> Gabby, we have a question. Do you uh -huh. prefer to collect larger rocks or a whole bunch of smaller ones? My preference as like a pilot like who likes collecting rocks? I guess doesn't, doesn't specify, but I don't. Sure. I think they are both fun. Big rocks are quite satisfying, but little rocks means lots of stops and lots of sampling. It's true. Big rocks are heavy, and someone has to carry that around <laughs> the ship. So it's it's weird how that isn't <laughs> the person who collected them. Maybe it should be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, well, I don't want to carry that. <laughs> the moment I saw you pick it up. <laughs> we were kind of letting them finish the steps out so we didn't get too far ahead, but up to you. Sorry, say again? Uh, we were letting them finish the steps out so we didn't get too far ahead. Oh, that sounds awesome. Okay. Especially if he's able to start and stop and not end up yeah. off in Never Never Land. Then... No, it's been going really smoothly. So. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because we're like 75 or something meters behind. Yeah, I try to wait till it's like 50 or less and then Perfect. we kind of move on. In the confetti jungle. What are we doing? What's that move bearing again? Is it one six five? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. one six four. Yeah.
looks like uh, maybe just doing a little bit of a heading change. Maybe, maybe not. So here we have another sponge stock that's so just covered by all those brittle stars. Mm -hmm. This to the seems right, to be a common occurrence. This? I've seen it quite often, just having all these brittle stars just hanging out on a sponge to stock yeah. that has no top. Okay, go ahead. To the right, there was a pink star, I think. Yeah, Is that yeah. a star or a cucumber? Don't know. The pink one, I believe, is a slime star, a hymenaster. Oh, cool. And then I think there was a little cucumber lower down. Yeah, this is one of those things I definitely don't want to collect because I just don't want to have Go to deal zoom. with it. They don't call them slime stars for nothing. They're quite cute. I know, they're, they're kind of pretty. Slime star. Yeah, they're pretty adorable, but I don't know how adorable they would be <laughs> okay, with, like, with buckets and buckets of mucus. Yeah, let me turn into <laughs> jelly. I'd like to put a ban on the word mucus on watch. <laughs> can only say it so many times. It's just so gross every time. <laughs> There's a viewer commenting on what looks like old trees laying sporadically on the seafloor. Uh, they're actually not old trees, but dead sponges. So maybe, Megan, you could answer the question. And instead of being old trees, uh, they're asking how long does it take for them to decompose? Do you know how long or has anyone studied how long dead sponges and corals take to decompose? Um, well, it takes longer than a human lifetime, that's for sure. Uh, so there isn't any real data on how long it takes for these uh, sponges and corals to decompose, but we know that it takes a really long time, um, especially since uh, these sponges are glass sponges. So their skeleton is make, made up of glass and glass doesn't really decompose. Uh, the spicules could eventually spread out over time, um, but you're just not going to see them just completely rotting away like you might think um, it would. So, yeah, it takes a really long time, and uh, these sponges might have toppled over due to their size. So when that happened, it could have taken even longer time just for the animal itself um, to, to fully just die off um, after that toppling event. But there's really no way to know how old that particular sponge skeleton is. But we know that it is extremely old because a lot of these sponge skeletons have ferromanganese crusts growing over them. And our geologists have told us that it takes millions of years to ferro for ferromanganese crusts to grow. So that's sort of an indicator of how old some of those skeletons might be. I'm kind of interested so in that guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. And yeah, we've been seeing a lot of those uh, Romilla Gorgia militaris. They're, they seem to be the most abundant coral on the seamount so far. And here we've got a small bamboo coral. Cool. Yeah, so this one hasn't branched. It might not never branch. Um, so we usually describe bamboo corals based okay, on their branching pattern, whether they're branching at the nodes, so those are those little black bands on the skeleton, or the internodes, so those are those white bony parts. And then for the ones that don't branch, we just call them unbranched. And from there, we can split them down into clades. And, and clades are these sort of pseudotaxonomic groups that we're using to describe um, bamboo corals. Um, there's been some genetic work on them. Oh, there's even taller bamboo Can you bring Argus around there. to 165? So I don't okay. get lost here. I don't have a lot of uh, sonodyne, like good sonodyne pings.
Only like oh, 10 yeah, degrees it's jumping off around a bit. Thanks, Aaron. That was super helpful. You're welcome. Yeah, I think we've been seeing a lot more of those dead sponge stalks because we've gotten to this sort of flat-ish area uh, that, that's like at the base of a cliff almost. Uh, we are making our way up the side of a mountain, basically. And so uh, anything that was alive further up would eventually tumble down to here and stop. So that's why I think we're seeing a lot of those dead mm. sponges. So I'm crossing my fingers that as we make our way to the summit, we're gonna see a lot of those really cool sponges. It might not happen, but just uh, hoping. We're pretty close, right? To the top top? Oh Kinda? my gosh, no. Oh, no? Oh, no, no. We're like, no. what, halfway? Oh. oh, no, no, no. Let me just let me just zoom out for you. Oh, I was not. I saw the other point and thought that was. Yeah, we're just oh, on Baby Mountain. Mm, okay, that's where my confusion was. Yeah. This is a large Brzinga. <laughs> Very oh, yeah. large. It is big. They are very beautiful. That, that nice orange color definitely attracts attention. Yeah, so neat. Okay. So we'll be coming over this uh, this little knoll, and then okay, it looks like uh, twenty, thirty meters down on the other side. Um, to come across this, yeah, yeah, it'll be yeah twenty meters. Okay. Pretty flat, I think. Yeah. And then we'll start heading up this ridge towards uh, the next waypoint. Hoping to see some fish. There's been a couple fish today, but nothing on this watch so far. I'm gonna do another step or two with that same bearing and then we'll start moving along. Okay, that sounds great. Bridge nav, another five zero meters, 164. It's one of those marble floaty things. Goodbye. Well, that's a really nice uh, cr uh, crinoid or feathers or uh, sea lily is the common name. Nice big one. The one I'm aiming at? Yep, that big yellow one. So this is an intact version of the one that we were looking at a little bit earlier. See how it has five arms, so it's a hyocrinid. Go for zoom video. So I'm looking to see if it has any discs along the stock, but I don't see any discs. But it does seem to have a, a little buddy there on the other side, near the top. Would you prefer to keep this clear and just rely on the DVL? Um, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Um, we're in a really flat area, so it seems like 
Yes, let's try that. Okay. I'll shorten up the trail for a while. Just, yeah. You're just going to try and make the trail shorter? Uh, yeah, until it cleans up a bit. Seems like we're at the top of the little knoll. Hooray! On to the next bit. That's it. That's pretty cool. Pretty defined edge. What's that? That's a co pretty cool defined yeah. edge on it. Yeah, totally. We're going to do a swap in the video chair. Roger. Oh. That's a neat little rock outcropping. I'm surprised there isn't coral all over the top of it. Some of these uh, Romilla Gorgias. Next move, we're going to just be doing 180 for a while. What's that? We're going to be doing 180 for a while to come along okay. this way. Okay, sounds good. Bridge nav, can we get a five zero meter step bearing one eight zero? Okay, sounds good. We'll keep an eye on it as well. Thank you.
Yeah, there's a few different ways. I mean, if it's only 30 meters, <clears throat> I wouldn't uh, go as far as, um, you know, flipping around or anything like that. And it's not really that steep, so, you know, it's not a very, very small part of the overall dive to have a maybe not perfectly lit sea floor. Yeah, I think what you're doing there right now is fine. Welcome back. Oh, look at that down there, the end of the table. That thing, that pile of things, yes. Looks really nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, what for fifteen minutes for just like our blue water again?
there's some sort of anomaly on this knoll that uh, makes the US, USPL go mad. Something about coming up on top of this knoll makes the USPL go mad. Yeah, it, it's been a bit angry. Mm. Well, I was hoping to reach this waypoint during the 12 to 4 watch, and I was hoping for pretty substantial coral communities, but... Uh -uh. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for the sound effect. <laughs> There's some really nice rocks. Yeah. And yeah. sediment. Not quite at our next rock sampling interval. It's just uh, a slight. Be a little on the quiet side for just a moment. We're settling in after our meal break. You notice there's a bit of a pause. Oh, that's what's going on. Front row, are we moving forward in a particular direction? Or we're we moving just... sideways in a particular direction. Uh, okay. Well, actually, we're moving south okay. as a ship, and yeah. these guys are playing. Okay. No, we're lateraling <laughs> down slope. We could face completely the direction of our travel, which would mean we see approximately nothing because of the down slope. So Antonella's got some sideways action here to get a little more bottom in view. Bigger picture, Steve, do you see high pack? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the saddle. Yeah. Yeah, we're just doing that, but. Okay. Yeah. Just pretend they're not there. I'll just turn Argus off. He's just all over the place. Argus is like, here, 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 here.
Like we're entering into a vast valley of sediment here. <laughs> like a giant spoon, like a chef size. <laughs> I want one of those comically large spoons, like they hang up above. <laughs> you just pull it from under the table. <laughs> yeah, there is. I don't know. That's what I thought of, though. I have to look next time I'm down there. The only one of you is on SPL, so now suddenly we just. Uh... I wonder sorry. what's up with the giant spoon. Uh, sorry, that was me talking on SPL. I shouldn't have been. There's a discussion <laughs> of a giant spoon. Operational chatter about a giant spoon. Going off SPL. Giant, giant sponge is what we meant, sorry. Right, talking right. Talking about the previous cruise. <laughs> or Lee and I guess, yeah, Mark's there too. Um, got a question from the chat. What criteria is used when determining which rocks to collect? Well, we're looking for ones that the ROV can grab, mostly. Um, and then we're also hoping to get pretty good sized rocks. So what I do is I scrape off the top so the more surface area there is, the more material I have to work with. So we don't want to grab a 500 pound rock? I would love to do that. I don't think Hurt can do that though. <laughs> Well, and not come back to the ship. <laughs> what are the weight limits of Herc? The weight limit on samples for Herc? Yeah. Uh, on this dive, our total sampling capacity would be... Well, here's some math. I'm going to get get you to do some math here. Uh, 17 times 3 plus 30. Okay. 17 times 3 plus 30, 81. Yeah, 81. Or maybe 100. Pounds or kilograms? Pounds. Okay. So no, we cannot pick up a 500 pound rock. <clears throat> we can. Herc has a lot of spare ballast, though. We could also include, uh, if we went in very, 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 very obnoxiously light, we could also probably throw another 100 pounds towards that. I comment. So the big rock that we had to put back on the last dive was heavier than 100 pounds then? I think it's a, 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 that's a total weight. The last dive? Uh, or last cruise, maybe? Probably the last cruise. Yeah, that was a big boy rock. That was a definitely over 100 pounds. Yeah, but if you already had samples, then it could have been smaller, but still, chunker. It, it, was, it was 100 pounds. Yeah? All on its own. It was a big, big rock. So the manipulator arms can lift something that heavy? Yeah, the limiting factor is definitely ballast. The uh, starboard manipulator can lift. Oh, what is it? Can I remember the spec sheet? Maybe not. I want to say 150 pounds at full extension, or like 250 got close. Is that true? Maybe it's more than that. I can't remember. A lot of weight, anyway. More weight than is useful for us. Uh, 
Look at the little flangey bit on the top. That's cool. Yeah. This one's a euplectelid also. Glass sponge. It has a uh, tenophore. A couple of tenophores on the sides. But uh, kind of on the far side right now. Yeah. Benthic tenophores. Ones that attach to the bottom. Fish. Fish. Hmm? Under the lasers. The mud. I see him. I lost the telestrator. Oh, you broke the telestrator now. I, I, I just took the stylus out. I don't know what happened. Okay, there it is. Steve. Done. Fixed it. The Argus view is not very good, is oh, it? Oh, because it's a touch screen. Oh, he saw you. He's running away now. You scared it with the telestrator? You're supposed to sneak up on him. Uh -huh. You can go ahead and zoom Aaron. I'll try to get closer. It's a high speed chase. This is the most active I've seen one of these cuskiels mm -hmm. in a while. Bye. Bye, Bye fish. I'm going to catch up to Argus. <laughs> I see that. Well, oh, really? So when we were talking about being on top of an epicenter of an earthquake, Trevor, was what you were thinking of a sea quake? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Because I'm looking into this because I am, was curious. Okay. And according to Scripps, uh, it says that a seismic wave from an earthquake can emerge from the seafloor as an acoustic wave that travels through the ocean and it can strike a ship and sometimes it can violently rock it. They're called sea quakes and sometimes people on board think that they've hit ground, that the movement is so strong. That's also cool, yeah. That isn't what I was thinking of, but that is also a cool thing. Uh, before we left, someone in the chat uh, suggested methane bubbles. Ah, uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Okay, let me look that up. Yeah, are you curious or are you paranoid? Which one? <laughs> oh, no, I'm curious. I'm a strong swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> Only 100 miles to the nearest island. I was going to say, it's pretty strong. Plus, plus all the things in the water. Well, <laughs> and and none of Marlene's snack. Oh, <laughs> you'd have to do it without it. At least we're in warmer waters. You got that going for you. I have a really big bag of Takis, so hoping that'll <laughs> be enough for the trick. <laughs> Whatever the farthest anyone has swam is. 
Okay, Uns let me look that up. <laughs> unsupported. It's a good question. That is definitely something that is a record, and I have seen it, so you will be able to find it. The longest distance ever swum without flippers in open ocean is 225 kilometers. What? Yes. No. Uh, Croatian national, I, mm, I'm i so sorry to this Croatian national. I do not know how to pronounce your name. Veljko Rogosic, swam across the Adriatic Sea. Uh, uh, from 29 to 31 August in 2006. 29 to 31 August. That is <laughs> multiple days of swimming. Yeah, that's hm. crazy. Oh. Congratulations. <laughs> Vel, Vel, okay. Velkio, how do you, how does Croatians pronounce the V-E-L-J-K-O? It's like a, it's like a yeah sound, right? Velkio? None of us are Croatian. Okay. I'm not Croatian. No. Croatians, send us <laughs> your pronunciations in the chat. I actually do know a Croatian. I could ask, but it's going to take a minute. Yeah. Technically, my aunt is Croatian. Technically. Technically. She is Croatian. <laughs> Theoretically, she is Croatian. <laughs> Joanne. Aunt Joanne, if you're there. <laughs> Let me know how to pronounce his name. Yeah, methane bubbles that have uh, sunk ships uh, in the Bermuda area. Yeah, that's a bad scene. Right before my first international, uh, no, well, yeah, it would, it would have been my first flight that I remembered. Um, my uh, marine biology teacher happened to mention that a uh, the, uh, I don't know what they're called, the, the downdrafts that catch planes and like it's impossible to recover and you just crash. I was like, oh, thank you. Also, why aren't we talking about the ocean? Not <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are this commenter's favorite watch. Go team. Hey. Team Blue Water. What a stark line between these two areas. That's yeah, funny, isn't it? It's the no nodules beyond this point line. <laughs> Weren't you paying attention? Did you see the sign? Where's the little bouncer? I don't... <laughs> One of those acrobat snails. <laughs> Yeah, those snails are really have a, a fun family name. They're the Margarita Day. Uh, it makes me think of margaritas, and then you're like, hmm, I could go for a margarita. There's definitely like a nerdy pun shirt out there about Margarita Day, like that. A scientist is wearing somewhere in the world. Like I can feel it. Like, <laughs> if if there's not, there is now. Someone is currently <laughs> making it. <laughs> 